When talking about the applications of blockchain technology, people start by discussing currencies, finance, and then more general business applications, such as to supply chain management, and then later about its potential applications for the Internet of Things. What is rarely talked about is its application to the environment, but as we'll try to illustrate in this video, this could turn out to be one of its most important potentials. To understand why this is so, we need to appreciate that the reason we're in an environmental crisis is largely a function of the design of our economic system. We developed our modern industrial framework in a world that was industrializing with abundant natural resources and limited industrial infrastructure. The system was set up to grow GDP by producing and consuming more products with limited interest to the effect that they had on the environment. As a consequence, natural capital was not accounted for in the system, creating a strong incentive for people to simply overuse natural resources, converting this natural capital that was not accounted for into increases in GDP and profit. Today, of course, we realize that this whole linear economic framework is unsustainable, and one of the most effective ways to alter the model is to try and incorporate the costs and benefits that accrue from ecosystems into economic models of accounting. This means essentially placing a value on the ecosystem so that people factor the full environmental costs of their actions into the cost-benefit equation under which they're acting. And we call this full cost accounting or natural capital accounting. This idea is not so new. Indeed, it's becoming ever more mainstream. In a recent Ernst & Young report entitled Accounting for Natural Capital, the Elephant in the Boardroom, the executive summary starts by saying, quote, Natural capital will become as prominent a business concern in the 21st century as the provision of adequate financial capital was in the 20th century. We are already drawing down on 50% more natural capital a year than the Earth can replenish, and the rate of depletion is accelerating. All too soon, businesses will face a stark choice, adapt or fail. This powerful capacity of blockchain token economies to design new incentive structures has the potential to fundamentally alter this current dynamic between economy and environment. When designed properly, token economies can provide powerful incentive structures for people to collaborate on growing some underlying resource of value to the community. This same capacity can be harnessed to develop and grow the natural capital of a community towards building their ecosystem. Unlike our traditional industrial age economic system that simply quantified and incentivizes people to consume products, by creating token systems, we can actually incentivize and reward people for any action that is beneficial to growing ecological resources. Tokens can be gained by choosing less consumptive options that conserve and replenish resources. As example, we can think about a small town in rural Australia that has a limited amount of water to go around. A finite amount of water tokens could be issued and earned for any activity that conserves on water. For example, if you replace your plumbing with a system that leaks less, you would earn water tokens that could be used elsewhere or traded for fiat currencies. This means that people can earn by conserving resources, creating an economy around that and an incentive system. Or with respect to carbon emissions, a token economy could likewise be created to manage this in a distributed fashion. Every time you emit carbon, you could pay for it with a kind of carbon coin. Every time you sequester carbon, you get paid in carbon coins. When all carbon coins have been redeemed, the world is running at net zero carbon. Likewise, any community could take account of its stock of natural capital and issue a finite amount of tokens to the community members. If someone does something that is ecologically beneficial to growing that underlying stock, they could earn more tokens. Likewise, if someone wants to chop down lots of trees, they would have to purchase tokens from others. This would incentivize people to go and plant trees or perform other activities that contribute to their ecosystem in order to earn tokens. In such a way, ecological services would not have to be managed and performed by a centralized authority, as everyone could clean the lake or switch to renewable energy to earn carbon tokens and thus provide environmental services.
Of course, closed organizations have always seen the benefit of conserving in their production processes because it directly affects their balance sheets. But what is happening with token economies though is that we can push that capacity to benefit from conserving out to the end user and the edges of the network so that we can harness everyone's incentives to conserve, which is potentially a much more powerful mechanism than centralized organizations simply telling people to be nice and environmentally friendly, which doesn't really work because it lacks real incentives. Of course, the move towards a full cost economy will not happen overnight. Already, it has been growing over the past decades with such things as organic food, green bonds, carbon trading, etc. Incentivized recycling systems are already made possible on the blockchain via the Ethereum token-based dApp called Recycle to Coin. The token platform allows the public to exchange harmful plastic at their reverse vending machines. These cryptocurrencies can then be exchanged on crypto exchanges for other currencies. The recognition and increasing quantification of ecosystem services, coupled with the development of a fully-fledged blockchain natural capital accounting system, could support a fundamental reorganizing of the incentive structures in our economy towards one that is systematically more sustainable. As Prince Charles noted, the ultimate bank on which we all depend the bank of natural capital is in the red. The debt is getting ever bigger, and that's reducing nature's resilience and considerably impeding her ability to restock. It leaves us dangerously exposed. Fixing that equation requires a new accounting system, and the blockchain could be a critical technology enabling that. The blockchain would not only be important in enabling a token economy for managing ecosystems capital, but also as a system for tracking authenticating and making transparent the underlying workings of supply chains and business activities. At present, when we go to buy something, we have little idea where it came from or how it was actually made. Supply chains are conventionally held secret, limiting the stakeholders who can prevent environmental, social, health and safety problems. In such a system, there are so many intermediaries that it's very easy to be deceitful. Companies can perform all sorts of actions without it being revealed to the end user, who gets greenwashed by massive amounts of advertising, so that they don't know what to think when walking down the supermarket aisle. Blockchain technology could enable environmental transparency along the supply chain of products. A blockchain network could be used to ensure that a fish that is being sold through the Tokyo market actually came from a sustainable fisherman in Indonesia or to track the actual price that the villagers in Kenya were paid for their coffee beans. For example, the Provenance blockchain has been used to verify proof of payment to 55 farmers whilst tracking coconuts from Southeast Asia to Europe. The initiative has demonstrated the possibility of using blockchain technology to track ethical claims and digitally prove their fair trading practices. Working with the NGO Fair Food Provenance tracked ethical claims on a thousand coconuts. They tracked the movement of payments and products along the supply chain, registering the harvest via SMS messages and verifying chain of custody along the supply chain. As discussed previously, the blockchain is not magic. It can only authenticate what is within the network. In order to ensure that the information that is inputted into the system is authentic and correct, it needs to work in tandem with other technologies. Here again, the blockchain will have to intersect with IoT systems and big data advanced analytics if we're going to be able to automatically ensure that the fish was fished at the data location inputted to the network. Data automatically inputted from tamper-proof IoT systems and cross-correlated with data points from a multiplicity of other sources could work to create truly trustworthy inputs and reliable information to someone on the other end of the supply chain automatically without human intervention via the distributed database. For example, an IoT device in a warehouse might scan the RFID tags on pallets when they come in to verify the date of entry automatically with that information sent directly to the blockchain. This is one of the advantages of big data. Big data, by definition, is decentralized not relying on a single data source, but multiple varied sources cross-correlated. 
Blockchain networks themselves can't provide a trustworthy supply chain. They'll have to be integrated with these other technologies, enabled by trusted automatic and distributed oracles for data input that are not dependent upon corruptible third-party institutions. This is, of course, particularly relevant in parts of the world where government organizations are not trustworthy. Knowing that the apple you bought has been certified organic by a country at the bottom of the list of corrupt nations doesn't really tell you very much. On a broader level, we can identify the centralization of many existing systems as a huge source of vulnerability in our world of climate and environmental change. In a world of stability, centralization appeared to create efficiencies and stability. But today, we're increasingly recognizing that these large, centralized components create critically vulnerable single points of failure with huge dependencies. Large, centralized components like big financial institutions, electrical power stations or factories also create inertia within the system. They reduce adaptive capacity and the agility required to deal with systemic changes. By supporting peer-to-peer -peer distributed systems, the blockchain can enable greatly more agile, adaptive, and potentially more resilient networks with low dependency on critical centralized elements. Removing the need for centralization of resources could also greatly increase the efficiency of these networks, as resources can be exchanged locally without having to always be routed to a centralized component. Blockchain platforms can enable local food systems where the food is grown locally, disintermediating long and complicated supply chains of supermarkets by matching producers and consumers within peer-to-peer -peer local networks. Or as another example, blockchain-based Power Ledger provides a platform for people to trade energy peer-to-peer -peer within a local smart grid. Within this platform, people can simply trade electricity with one another and receive payment in real time from an automatic and trusted reconciliation and settlement system. There are many other advantages to this also, such as being able to select a clean energy source, trade with one's neighbors, receive more money for excess power, benefit from the transparency of all trades on a blockchain, low transaction costs, and automation through smart contracts.